Fine, I will attempt to build an entire building in a single episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Black Magic Craft. Well, last weekend was one hell of a weekend. As I'm sure you could tell by last week's episode, the man, Hankerin Fernail himself, was in town. And then I had a crazy week at work and stayed out drinking and eating a crazy, like, 12 course supper with my coworkers for like six hours yesterday. And then I woke up today and went, oh man, I haven't thought about what I'm doing this weekend for a video. And that's a dangerous thing to all of a sudden have to film a video when you don't have anything planned or prepped. So I could have went the easy way, but I felt like the last few videos didn't really touch on the heart of the channel, which is actually instructional tutorials. So I felt like I needed to make that happen this episode. And I considered doing something really easy and fast. And then I said, you know what? Screw it. Let's go all in and finally tackle something that I know basically everybody wants because it gets asked for like more than anything else. And that's to actually build a full house uh, in a tutorial. And, you know, you've seen the houses that I have on my shelves and in photos and stuff. And they're fairly involved builds. I mean, they're not actually that hard to do, but they're hard to condense into like a 20 to 30 minute tutorial video and also it's hard to build in one day and I like to film in one day but I still wanted to build a house for you guys so I thought well why don't we start small every time this little farmhouse here shows up in a picture or a video people go nuts for it and ask about it and it was a really easy build so I figured why don't I just do that but the way I built this it was early on and I liked it, but it's not how I actually would have wanted to build it again. So I built a new one, a little bit bigger so that it's at least, you know, more substantial of a project. And I think it turned out pretty awesome. I didn't get a chance to paint it this weekend because like I still have glue drying on this and it needs a coat of Mod Podge and then paint and washes. That's not happening today. However, this house I built today and it's fairly detailed and I did it in a couple hours start to finish. So this video is proof positive that you can tackle a detailed little foam structure like this in an afternoon start to finish. Maybe not your first try will take you a little bit longer, but it doesn't have to be like a month long project. So I'm going to show you today how to build it. And then next week, I'm going to show you how to paint it and embellish it and finish it and all that fun stuff. But that's why this bad boy is still pink at the moment. So without further ado, let's go over to the crafting table and let's build a house. So to build this, you are going to need some sort of material to act as a substrate or framework for this little house. And there are a ton of different materials you can use for this. This project's a perfect candidate for cardboard if that's you know one of the main things you like to use or have access to. You can do it out of uh, XPS foam, like out of half inch or inch thick foam, or you can use what I'm deciding to use here, which is just dollar store foam core. It doesn't really matter. Each one has some strengths and weaknesses. Um, you have to decide what is the material that you just prefer to work with. Uh, cardboard is nice and stiff and free and holds glue really well but uh, it also doesn't take anything with water very well and uh, so I like to avoid it because of warpage uh, half inch XPS foam which is what I use on a lot of stuff I find a little bit too big and bulky uh, to quickly use for this so I get go in the middle and I use foam core now the nice thing about foam core is it's really easy to work with it's cheap you can get it at the dollar store uh, big sheet for a buck and it's just really easy to cut. When you're doing this, foam core will come with two layers of paper on it. And that keeps this thin layer of foam nice and stiff and sturdy. 
So it's a good idea to keep that paper on the foam. But the thing is, if you are using this ready board, uh, if you're using this ready board brand foam core from the dollar store, it's best property. And the reason that it gets used a lot in terrain building is that you can easily peel this paper off. The glue is very, very weak. So I am always hesitant to leave this paper on a substrate for a build because once you start adding like PVA glue or Mod Podge or a wash, I don't want to like build on this paper layer and then have it bubble up and peel off and ruin my piece. So I sacrifice the stiffness on a small building because it's not really that big of a deal and I take the paper off just to play it safe. If you use another brand like the Elmer stuff that you can buy at Walmart or one of the hobby stores where the paper doesn't peel off well, then absolutely just leave it on and have the added benefit of the stiffness. Anyways, once you decide what material you want to use to build, like I said, it doesn't matter. This is a small house. You need to cut out four pieces. You need two roof pieces and the front and back to this simple house. The triangle pieces that you're going to use, you're going to want the bottom of the triangle to be five inches across and you're going to want from bottom to point to be three inches, uh, which makes this four. The roof pieces, you want this width to be the same as this on the triangle. So four inches by however long you want your little house to be. I find five inches is a nice number. It's the whole three, four, five rule. It just aesthetically kind of works and balances and seems right from a, des a design perspective. So cut two of each. And then what you have to do is on one of the roof pieces, you actually need to remove a strip from it that is the same thickness of whatever material you are using on the top so that they can overlap on the roof. So I am going to quickly do that here before moving forward. I'm just going to mark the thickness of this material. You likely want to use a ruler for this, but if you practice, you can do what's called finger gauging, but I have over a decade of carpentry experience that allows me to draw those kind of straight lines really easy. But essentially the trick is you stiffly hold the point of your pen on the finger where you want it and you just use your finger as a guide and get a really nice straight line. But use a ruler if you want. Gonna quickly cut this again. You can use a ruler to get a nice straight cut, but I find when working with foam core and this is just the frame. I don't get too, too fancy. We are going to glue the roof to these triangles, but I know that I'm going to want to have an overhang on the front and back uh, so that there's like some tolerance here. So when I build up the front with whatever material I decide to put on it, planks, plaster, whatever, there's that overhang to account for that. So again, I am going to mark out a line on this, on each edge as a reference for where I want um, my front and back pieces to sit. I would say a quarter inch is good. Again, you can measure this out if you want, or you can freehand it if you feel confident. The big thing is you just want it to be the same all the way around. So do whatever you need to do at your skill level to make these lines, but it's not rocket surgery. There we go. And now we can start to glue this thing together using those lines as a guide. Hot glue, real simple. Bead down the edge. And one nice thing about foam core with hot glue is that it actually tends to melt the foam a little bit. So you get a really strong bond with hot glue and foam core. And you can, if you'd like, on the inside where you're not going to see anyway, add another bead of hot glue to really weld that joint together. And we're going to do the same thing with this one. 
I'm not going to bother adding that other strength weld. I don't think it's really necessary, but just want to show you that you can. So here now is the roof piece that we cut the thickness of this one off. So you can see how they overlap here. And this one is a little bit trickier because you have to glue both at the same time while keeping things lined up. And that's why it's nice to have these reference lines. So glue, line up the two roof pieces and then just drop into place. And you have yourself a little roof structure. You can absolutely use PVA glue and pins for this if you have time to spare, but the hot glue is going to be much quicker. Now, the weak point of this is this right here, and there's a couple ways you can deal with that. You can just run your hot glue gun uh, inside, or you can take some thicker foam and add a little support beam to this because on the inside of this, nobody is going to see it anyway. Just cut something that fits fairly snug in there, but not so snug that it bows anything. And just something like that. Hot glue on two edges so it adheres to both layers of the roof. Push everything in. And then this will be nice and strong. And that is the very basic structure. And we can start moving on to some of the decoration. When I'm building little buildings like this and I've gotten past the structure and I want to start detailing, I like to start with the door. And a little tip is instead of every time trying to figure out what size door you want to make, just make yourself a little template to use as a guide. I found that for, you know, D&D size minis, a nice basic door size is one inch wide by an inch and a half tall. And that's just a really simple way to do it. And I cut a little template out of cardstock that I can use to quickly uh, template doors onto buildings. So I want to put this door right in the middle of the front. I'm actually just going to eyeball it because you know, it's pretty easy to get it close enough to center here. And I'm just going to mark out this doorway on the face of this building. Now, I don't bother typically making doors actually open unless it's on a complicated build. Something like this, I don't think it's necessary. So what I will do is essentially just glue a door straight to the face of this. And there's a few ways you can do this. You can do it with, you know, popsicle sticks, coffee stirrers, or uh, foam. And it's really a matter of taste. They all tend to look really good once done. It just depends what you have access to and what you like to build. So I think on this one though, I'm gonna keep it out of foam, my tried and true method. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to rip up some thin strips of XPS foam on the Proxon table. So now I got this really thin strip of XPS foam and I'm going to turn it into some board planks to make this door out of. Again, this is just one of many methods you can use to make wood planks and I don't even do mine the same all the time. I like to switch it up to keep it interesting, but this is one of many methods. What I want to do actually is just make one really long uh, wood plank that I can then cut up for the door. And because I know I want my door to be an inch wide, I want my planks to be a quarter inch wide so that four of them together will uh, 
make a complete one inch door. What I'm gonna do, the reason I'm making this one long one is that I wanna just draw wood grain down this and then cut it up and be good to go. You can use the wire brush technique that I've used in many videos uh, to do wood grain, but sometimes I like when the wood grain is a little bit more comical and pronounced, like more like a graphic element. Um, not such fine detail as the wire brush gives you, you know, sometimes it's nice to have it stand out. So I'm just using the pen to kind of lightly dent in some wood grain along this piece and, you know, have fun with this. Doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it's nice to add in a few knots here and there. And once you have that done, uh, another thing that's kind of nice to do is to make the planks stand out a little bit more when you put them together as a door is on one edge to kind of go along with a nail file and sand the edge, you know, breaking it in a few spots just so it's not a perfect straight line when all the different pieces come together. And here, I'm just going to cut it kind of on my original quarter inch line, but allowing myself to go a little bit wavy in spots. And again, I'm just going to quickly break this edge a bit. This is a little bit difficult to do because this piece is so incredibly flimsy. So now I just want to glue these onto here and I want inch and a half long or tall, whatever planks. And I'm just using my cutting mat to give me that measurement. And I know that I need four of these. Now I'm just going to glue these down. Again, you can use hot glue for this or PVA glue, depending on how long you're willing to wait for it to dry. Personally, I actually prefer a thin layer of PVA. It's a little bit cleaner and uh, gives a nice, strong, consist consistent bond. But if you want to keep working and you don't have time, you don't want to sliding around and hot glue is your friend. I'm also kind of intentionally leaving some spaces. So that looks a little bit more rickety. And that is the first part of your door. And the other thing you can do is create some cross braces. I'm just going to take a one inch wide piece of this and slice it down the middle to make some little cross braces. Now here, uh, this is getting a little bit too small <laughs> to consider using hot glue on. So I'm going to use some tacky glue and I find when working with little tiny pieces of foam like this, I, the easiest way to handle it is just use your exacto to kind of hold the piece and get a bit of that glue on the back. You don't need to go crazy and place it across the board. And it's up to you how precise you want this to look. Personally, when I'm doing, you know, like a simple farmhouse, something like this, I like it to look a little bit crooked and not so perfect. Now that we got a nice little door on, it's time to make a wood frame for this door. Again, uh, just ripped some plank on the hot wire table. Uh, this I made, I don't know, about a quarter inch wide by eighth of an inch, no, three sixteenths of an inch thick. It doesn't really matter. I just want something that is thicker than this material to look like 
heavy timber. You can cut this with a knife. You could use popsicle sticks for this. You do whatever you want. But the point is you want to have some kind of door frame and you want it to be thicker than the door. And again, like I always tend to do, I'm going to break some of these edges using a nail file. And really you only have to do two opposing edges because the other ones are going to be uh, glued to the structure and then covered later with the plaster. So just take two edges and file them down a bit. Same as the door planks. I want to do some kind of exaggerated wood grain. So I'm going to do it with a pen instead of the wire brush. I'm going to do this on the sides a little bit as well. We got a nice piece of timber. And the first thing I want to do is put one that goes right across the top, but I want it to span from, uh, from one side of the roof to the other. So first I need to cut this angle of the roof to start with. And I just hold it up, copy that angle, and then I can put it tight, kind of eyeball the angle again on the other side. And I get left with a nice, nice fit, hot glue, put it in place. And then for the uprights, uh, you can actually just Take a line of hot glue right on the structure itself. Place your beam, running it wild. And flush cut the end. Do the same on this side. Cut it flush, get it sitting right. And there you have a nice heavy timber door frame. And then you can kind of experiment with this, do whatever you want for a pattern. I always like having one that rides up the center towards the peak of the roof. So again, here, when doing something like this, I'm actually just gonna put my hot glue line right on the building, get my point that I've cut to fit into the roof and just right in place, I'm going to cut that flush with that beam. And this all becomes a matter of taste of what you want the rest of this pattern to be. So I'm going to just pause the video finish all my timber work on the front and back and then review it once I'm done. So I've got all my timbers on. On the front I just did these bottom pieces after the door frame and then on the back kept it real simple bottom middle and then a vertical. I am going to do some more on the edges of the roof uh, like a soffit kind of thing or fascia I guess you should say but first I want to actually do the roof material and this is where you could go a bunch of different routes. You could go with individual shingles, and if you do that, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Cardboard, chipboard, foam shingles, popsicle sticks, whatever. There's a lot. Uh, it's a very time-consuming way to do things. You could do like a thatch roof, and again, there's a bunch of different methods for that using, you know, unbound rope, teddy bear fur, towels, a whole bunch of different methods. But... The way I like to do it on a simple little farmhouse like this is fairly fast and efficient and not too difficult. And I like to do the horizontal long wood plank shingles. This is something that you don't see too often in ancient houses, but it definitely did exist. And also this is D&D &D and this is my world. So that's how my roof is going to be. Essentially what I want to do is have a bunch of strips of roof uh, that overlap. So I've cut XPS very, very thin. This is probably a 16th of an inch thick, you know, or like two millimeters or something is very thin. And I'm now going to want to rip this into planks that are half an inch wide, but I also don't care if these cuts are perfectly straight. In fact, I want them to be 
slightly wavy because I want it to have that old school look where the boards kind of followed the, the live edge of the tree that it was cut from. So I'm going to do that here. Just do some wavy cuts, keeping them all about half an inch. And because these are so thin, I've decided that it would be a little bit easier to draw the wood grain on after these are all installed. I may regret that because I've never really done it that way before, but it's nice to try new things. Even if they don't work, you guys can learn from my mistakes. Again, PVA glue or Mod Podge would be an excellent adhesive for this. But if you want to make this quickly, like I want to make it quickly right now, hot glue is going to be the fastest way to do this and it'll hold up just fine. In fact, it's going to add a lot of strength to the piece. So cut that flush there. And then now I'm going to do the next line and I'm going to overlap some. I'm going to eyeball this and just try to keep it consistent moving up the rest of the roof. So I'm going to pause the film for a bit and work my way up and then we'll take a look when it's done. Okay. So as you can see, I progressed a little bit further than just doing these uh, roofing planks because I got a little bit carried away and that's what you have to do in a project like this. Get in the zone and just keep adding details. I also did not want to painstakingly videotape and edit every single step. All the techniques that I used to get here, I've already covered in both this episode and former ones, but let's review what I did uh, so you can take some inspiration from it. So I continued with these roof planks all the way up to the top. When they got to the top, I took one thin one and I folded it and basically did a cap bend across the whole thing. And then I took my ballpoint pen and I drew in all the wood grain. And I got to say on something like this, where you have continuous planks and you can run your pen the whole length, it was a lot easier to do it in place with the pen than it would be on the strips. But every application is different. So you have to judge it as you go. I also then decided on this little bit of overhang that uh, sticks out from the roof of the structure to add some wood grain just in case you see it. And then I added some more timbers exactly like these ones as a fascia board on the front and back that hid the edge of our roof uh, piece like from the foam core as well as the edge of the shingles and it was really simple you know start this angle cut send one piece long and then just eyeball the vertical plumb cut on this peak right just look at it cut it in place and then for the second piece do the same thing just eyeball a cut put it in there's absolutely no measuring involved in any of this stuff it's all just hold it in place eyeball it cut it glue it and whenever possible glue the piece on sending it long and then cutting it to length afterwards i decided i wanted to dress this up a little bit so i added this top timber here which i've you know notched in and done a bit of a you know little detail and this one i hot glued in place but very carefully because i didn't want the hot glue blobbing all over but i did use some tacky glue in these joints and once that dries it'll be really strong i also took some very small pieces of diagonal timber and stuck them in the tops from this one beam up into these fascia boards and again it's just take your piece like like this cut an angle cut an angle get left with something like that put some wood grain on it and then just glue it in place. And 
these two pieces are interconnected and it looks like they're notched in, but they're not. You just use the foam's softness to your advantage and just push the piece in place. And then once the glue dries, it'll be really strong. Last thing I did was to add these additional timbers on top. It's something you see often on plank uh, roof houses. They have these additional timbers that just kind of, I guess, keep these shingles in place. I'm not exactly sure why they're there structurally, but I think it looks cool and it adds some interest to a simple building like this. And I think that's what you need to keep in mind when building something like this is keep it simple. Don't get too carried away, but have fun with some of the details. These little embellishments, they don't take that long to do, but they take a little building and make it a lot more interesting. It takes a long time to build complicated structures, but it doesn't take a long time to make a small structure detailed. And the last thing we need to do on this is actually do the stucco in these exposed areas, if you want. I personally like to do a pretty heavy textured stucco on them. So let's take a look at how I do that. So for these stucco areas, just like every part of this project, there are a lot of different methods you can use to accomplish this. Uh, the simplest method uh, that gives you the least amount of texture would be just to tinfoil ball this foam core before you build it, and then it will give you that nice little bit of texture. I prefer something that's a little bit more deep in its detail and it picks up the washes and the paints a little bit better. And you can fill these spots in with like a mixture of joint compound and glue or Mod Podge. Same thing I've coated other projects in like my rocks and my cave doors and that sort of thing. And that works really well, but it can be a little bit difficult to work it into these tiny spaces. So the method I like to use is the old just play sand and PVA glue technique. This gives a lot of texture and it makes the piece very strong on these walls and it's easy to get into the corners. It is, however, a little bit messy, but hey, you know, sometimes you gotta get messy. So I just take a bit of PVA glue that has been a bit watered down and work it into all the corners. Take some play sand and essentially just sprinkle it in to this glue. And you want to avoid really big pieces of sand, like the big, big aggregate, if possible. And once you've got the sand covering the whole area, you can take your piece and knock off all the excess loose stuff. I would advise, if possible, doing one side of this, letting it kind of dry up and then flipping the piece and doing the other side so that this doesn't sag while it's drying. Go through and fill all of your spaces with glue and sand and then let it dry. All right, so now I've got all my sand drying here, the glue for the stucco stuff. And this thing is essentially done and ready to get coated in Mod Podge to stiffen it up. Now, a couple of things I'd like to point out. The first being that off camera, I experimented with a different technique to kind of weather these wood beams in a kind of interesting way. I'm not sure how much you can really notice, but I was able to get these to be a lot wavier and kind of curled. And also I was able to make this door look really distressed and old. And it was with a pretty cool technique that I'm gonna save for a future video. I think maybe I'll do a little Patreon thing to show my Patreon supporters first, uh, but I will approach it later as its own method for now. You know, if this is your first time building one of these things, uh, I think you wanna you know, keep it kind of simple uh, and just get the project done. That being said, when I distressed this door so much, it did make the front of this kind of weak. So I used a coffee stir stick 
along the bottom here to kind of stiffen it up. You know, gave it some wood grain so it just looked like the threshold for the door. And then the other thing is when you build something like this, you might find if you're using foam core that these edges are kind of flexible and soft. So one way you can stiffen them up is just by hot gluing some popsicle sticks along the edges and then this becomes really nice and sturdy. So that's it for the build. Keep things simple if it's your first time and then build upon that and experiment with details and techniques. All right, guys, there you have it. One finished house, farmhouse, cottage, cabin, whatever. Um, yeah, it's a couple hours of build time and you can do it. Like I said, I'm gonna cover how to paint it and finish it and do a couple little added little embellishments next episode. Also, that secret technique that I mentioned at the end there, that's gonna get its own dedicated video again don't worry about that yet. If you're just starting out, just try to build the structure and some of the details. If you've been building stuff for a while and you want to figure out how I did that, yeah, there's a chance you could probably figure it out if you really think about it based on the, the way it looks. But you can also head on over to Patreon. I'm going to post a little teaser video of that technique to explain how I did it for my Patreon supporters until I finally make the full-fledged video. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about this is that the architecture of this building doesn't really make sense uh, in terms of comparing it to real-world history. It's not quite the style of house that the, you know, the Nordic people, the Vikings made. It's not quite the style of house that the Saxons made or anything that you'd see in the Dark Ages. It has a little bit from all over the place kind of mashed together in a aesthetic that I like and that is simple to build. And remember, we're not doing historically accurate, perfect models. Well, maybe you are if you're playing that kind of game, but I'm not. If you're playing D&D, you're just building cool stuff for a fantasy world. And yeah, maybe Saxons used thatched roofing and Vikings had grass on the roof, whatever. This one has wood planks because in my world, that's how the farmers build their houses. And that's something you should always keep in mind when building stuff for your D&D game. Don't worry too much about historical accuracy because there is no real historical accuracy for your made up fantasy world. And of course, if you found this video useful and you enjoyed it, hit that like button and drop me a comment below and hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have already a long time ago and you just keep hearing me say it and you're like, dude, I've like subscribed so long ago. Why don't you go tell your gaming group about Black Magic Craft, your buddies at work, whatever. Just tell some people about the channel, send them some links and let's try to build this community even bigger. And if you want to attempt building a project like this or any of my other ones and you want to pick up the right tools and equipment to do so while simultaneously helping fund the production of these videos, you can go over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment store. All the stuff there is links through my Amazon affiliate account. So if you make purchases through those links, I get a commission and that's what in no small part funds these videos. So you need a hot wire table, you need some glue, you need whatever, head on over there, purchase it through Amazon. It'll get shipped to your door and continue to get videos funded. And the other way, the, like the best way that you can really help out the channel is by supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. Those funds every month are what pay me to do this, essentially. And more importantly, the people that are supporting me on Patreon, we have developed a really awesome small community. There are lots of big communities for this hobby and sometimes it can feel like your project posted is just like a drop of water in the ocean and it can be overwhelming. And if you'd like to be part of a smaller, more close knit community of fellow DMs, crafters and terrain builders, you can do that by joining 
the Black Magic Craft Fellowship, which is one of the reward levels on Patreon. We got a private Facebook group. We brainstorm ideas, suggest videos, help each other with projects, do Google Hangouts that I'm supposed to do monthly, and I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't do it quite as often as I should. We got to do a soon one soon, but the point is, it's just a cool place to hang out and get to know other people in your community uh, without feeling like one in twenty thousand, and it helps me out a lot in no small way, both financially and just emotionally. It's really great. So consider supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. And until next week, guys, cheers, happy crafting.